<laughs> I know you're pregnant. All right, so uh, this is... up like every hour. Right? Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I was up from like 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. the night before last, and I was like, oh, what, what were we thinking having so many kids? <laughs> But uh, we found it was mostly ear infection stuff, so that it will it will get better. But um, and of course, poor kids. <laughs> anyway, white dot syndrome. This is the fast version of the lecture I gave before, and I basically took a bunch of slides and combined them. And uh, so we'll just kind of fly through it. Again, don't have any financial conflicts to disclose. I'll play leases. This is one of the only traditional slides on here. Um, this one and maybe the next one. This is a very heterogeneous group of inflammatory disorders, and there's a lot of other things they look like. I mean, it's one thing if you say, I'm going to study the white dots, but when you actually see a patient, they don't usually tell you they have a white dot syndrome, and if they do, they might be wrong. So you've always got to think about these infections, and some of the ones we've just talked about are up here. And uh, let's see. So what is a white dot syndrome? It's basically a non-infectious, so as far as we know, inflammatory disorder they usually has multiple discrete, well-circumscribed yellow-white lesions at the level of the retina, outer retina, RPE, choroid, capio, capillaris, blah, 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 during some phase of their course. But that's not actually true, and I'll show you that in a moment. So uh, I think of white dots, and I am no uveitis expert, and I thank God for that every morning when I wake up. <laughs> but here's the way I think about them. There's the big three, Azor, acute zonal outer occult retinopathy, occult outer retinopathy, they always say that backwards, multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis, and then MUDES. And these are considered to be Azor complex diseases. Why we decide to call them Azor complex diseases when Azor is like the least common and the hardest to diagnose out of the group, I have no idea. They have to be more like MCP, MUDES, spectrum, or something like that. And then once I get past these three on this triangle, I think of this as like three points of the triangle, I think if each one has like a little a little sister, little, a younger brother that they take care of. So Azor has AAOR, which actually has manifestations that are easy to see. MCP has PIC. Uh, and again, you could find so many case reports of people showing up with MCP, and then they have PIC later on, or Azor, and then they have MUDES. I mean, it's really strange, whatever it is that's going on with these. Uh, and then MUDES, uh, you know, little uh, red-headed stepchild sister is the acute idiopathic blind spot enlargement syndrome. And why are these red and green? Uh, the, I'm not sure why I picked red, but the green one means it's not in the book, uh, even though it is one of the white dot syndromes. I'm not going to spend any time on it outside of what I just mentioned. And then these other three don't really relate to each other quite the same way. And they certainly don't relate to Azor complex, and I really put them outside of that category altogether. So you've got AMPI, acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy, serpiginous choroiditis, and birdshot retinochoroidopathy. Once you kind of think of these, I like to separate them out. That helps me to sort of uh, attack the diagnosis. And then, oh, by the way, we just told you that nice definition of a white dot syndrome. Well, three of these don't even have white dots, Azor, AAOR, and AIBES. So it's really not very fair. And some people call these inflammatory uh, chorioretinopathies of unknown etiology. That's kind of a mouthful. That's why we still, I still call them white dot syndromes. So, uh, Chris, you know, you're seeing some white stuff. It looks like it's under the retina. You see some blood vessels going over it. But which white dot syndrome does this look like? It or does it, right? It doesn't. So, it, and it, I also got this photo from the shield, so that's your first clue that it's not. And it's a, what they call retinovitreal lymphoma, what everybody also call primary intraocular lymphoma. So, again, just keep it in the back of your mind. I'm going to show you some pictures here. They're not all in the white dot uh, family. So, uh, Tamana, I don't describe the photo. Just tell me what you think the diagnosis is. Ampy. Well, Ampy typically has more white dots in the macula, whereas this, these are mostly outside the macula, right? And they're radial. Birdshot. Right, birdshot. So radial, they're somewhat ovoid. They're hypopigmented, which a lot of them start out hypopigmented, but, but birdshot stays that way. So uh, this is birdshot, and... It's, you know, you get, we always learn HLAA 29, 96% sensitive, but 7% of people in the U.S. have it, so it's not that specific, right? Um, even though the book says it's like 97% specific, it has some stupid line in there that clearly demonstrates it doesn't know what sensitivity and specificity are, but whatever. <laughs> but, so, older age, so there's a couple of these that I'm going to talk about that have older, that are older in age. Not everybody has birds. This, this is like your textbook variety. These things are so diverse in their manifestations that you're you can you're easily going to find somebody who breaks the rules in the next couple of years that you see. 
But textbook, and that's the best way to learn it first, is learn the, learn the typical stuff and then learn the exceptions. Textbook, these are going to be older. Nasal radial distribution, it's almost like they emanate in this kind of radial pattern. Sometimes they follow choroidal vessels. They do not become hyperpigmented over time. I think that's key. So symptoms, Chris, what would somebody come in if they got birdshot and, bird and didn't know it? Uh, what, would they, what would they describe their symptoms as? You know what, this is, they can, but that's not the typical thing. These folks will have something else that's a little more typical. Nictilopia. Right, nictilopia, good. So nictilopia is not common amongst the white dots, but it is seen here. Not everybody will say it. Again, I'm not going to give that little qualification again. We'll say everybody says it from now on. Blur vision floaters, nictilopia. Vitritis, yes or no, Tamana? Yes. That's right. Common, but variable severity. And Aaron, I got a question for you. Are these folks likely to get CNV? No. Right. Can they get it? Sure. But we're going to say for testing purposes, no. Okay. This picture has a bunch of vitritis in it, right? You can see the little... And by the way, the inferior nasal area is like the money shot for these guys with bird shot. That's the most common place you're going to see it. And I've actually gotten tricked twice over the last two years seeing somebody that has what I thought looked like bird shot, but HLA-A29 negative and otherwise really never developed vitritis or any of those other things. So uh, I had to... I had to call it quits. So vitritis, I'm going to mention vitritis on several of these entities. And when I say vitritis, you and especially in the more chronic ones, you want to think about some sequelae, right? I think I just asked you something. So Tamana, uh, what sequelae do I think of when I think of vitritis? Like what can vitritis lead to that's not good for the eye? Okay, blur vision. Didn't make it into my triad, but go ahead. What's the vision loss due to? They do get vision loss from vitritis but not specifically to the, to the uh, cells. Let's say the cells go away, but the cells were there a long time, and now they left behind something else. Lots of inflammation can lead to other bad things in the eye. Like una catarata, oh. right? So a cataract, you can get epiretinal membrane, and you can get CME. So those, when I say vitritis in some of these, these and Sam made this little, I drew this out. When I get bored making lectures, I just get on my iPad and draw pictures. <laughs> This turned out really silly. I got one other one that turned out silly. So that's what I want you to think about. So FA findings, uh, I'm just going to give you the answers in some of these because this will take too long. doesn't typically highlight your spots, but it's going to show you your CME, optic nerve head, leakage, some vasculitis, a little venulitis. Um, ICG is also going to show your spots, and they're going to be more numerous than on exam. Okay, It's going to show you those choroidal hypofluorescent spots. ERG findings, you only need to know ERG findings for two of these diseases, maybe three if you include Azor. I don't, Azor is so hard to test on. Um, ERG, anybody remember? It's delayed implicit time on 30 hertz flicker, and you get diminished scotopic B waves. That's one line that's worth memorizing at some point, once you've learned it, you know, lots of other stuff. So autofluorescence findings, eh. Not super helpful in following the disease, disease, in my opinion. The book doesn't really go into it too much, so I don't think it's to know. IMT helpful. This is my other category. Yes, absolutely. See some head nods. Good. So that's more or less what you need to know about birdshot in a nutshell. Okay, so moving along, uh, Aaron, what is this a white dot syndrome or not? No. Right. And what do you think it is? Mm -hmm. Name off a couple of things and, uh, that are protean. Syphilis. Right, it's syphilis, <laughs> and uh, and so it's syphilis. We're not going to talk about all the the rest of that presentation. Okay, so now we've got another white dot syndrome. Tamana, which white dot syndrome do you think this is? Go with your gut. This one I think is amphibious. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So fifty percent are have a prodromal illness. Symptoms are going to be blurred vision. They're going to get little blind spots, and these guys can't have photopsia. They don't, although I don't put them in the classic photopsia category. They do get vitritis, but they don't typically have a long disease course, so we don't worry about the big triad in these guys. Um, these are bigger lesions. They're in the macula. They're kind of creamy yellow, white placoid, right? It has a whole long name. It, acute posterior placoid pigment or acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy. I'm sure I'm going to say it wrong at some point during this lecture, but we'll just call it AMPI. And uh, do they get CNV, Aaron? Really? Right. 
I put rare. My, I don't know if you can ever say never on anything. I keep on telling my kids to quit trying to resolve arguments by saying you never do this. You always do this. They're always <laughs> saying them like that. Just discounts you everything you just said. All right. Uh, so Ampi associations. Uh, I don't think these are worth memorizing, but it is important to recognize that Ampi, as opposed to a lot of the other white dots, has a lot of systemic things going on. And Dr. Michael's not here. We shared a patient uh, that was originally presented. Somebody thought it was MUDES. Turns out it wasn't MUDES. I, I, anyway, we'll go into the details there because I only have one of her photos up here. She had Ampi, and it recurred in the same eye, and we initiated a workup, and it looks like she's got like either Wagner's or some weird thing. But anyway, no, 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 it's not Wagner's that we're worried about. It was microangiopathy, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, so, but she does have erythema nodosa. But the point is, look for other things. If it's just the first time and it self-resolves, no big deal. But if they, if they, uh, if it's a little bit unusual, uh, or if there's other systemic, systemic things going on, look around for other stuff. Okay, um, picture of Ampi. We're talking about this is obviously an FA, and so your FA findings, uh, Tamana. It's uh, early hypofluorescence, uh -huh. late hyper. Right, blocks early stains late. So it's in that blocks early stains late category. Most of these are, and it's worth knowing which ones are the exceptions. So there's my blocks early. Get your little blue thing around it. Stains late. Same patient. Okay, ICG findings. The hypofluorescent spots are equal to the number on FA. They're not greater than the ones that you see on FA. That's the hardest one for me to remember. But here's that patient I was telling you about, and that's her uh, ICG, and those are the same as her FA. She's shown the FA too. Autofluorescence findings. Uh, they kind of lag the exam. I thought it was helpful monitoring this particular individual because it would help me to see if there's some new activity, but it, it, if they truly do lag, then I guess it, I was behind. So that's her autofluorescence. And uh, IMT helpful? No. Now, if you, I'm not going to talk about relentless placoid chorioretinitis, but that's sort of the chronic version of AMP. If you do have that, then yeah, IMT probably is helpful. Uh, this is actually a patient that we suspected RPCN, but at least at this point, she still had AMPI. Risk factors for vision loss, foveal involvement, duh. Older age, okay. Unilateral disease, longer interval between initial and fellow eye involvement and recurrence in the same eye. Those things all kind of make sense, except maybe uh, the older and unilateral. 20% of folks are left with residual visual dysfunction, whereas when I was a resident, we'd always say, almost everybody does fine, don't worry about it. But some of them really do. I mean, look at all that stuff. You can't see well with RPE torched like that. Okay. Sunset glow fundus after an acute VKH. I was supposed to ask you guys that, but I just read it to you. Mm -hmm. So it's not a white dot, but you can see how it might masquerade just looking at that. All right, Dan, <laughs> it's your turn to shine. What's our What's the diagnosis here? Just you could uh, if you can't turn on the mic. Yeah, you can. Good. You could act it out. <laughs> <Sorry. Tempted. laughs> that, yeah, you got it. Serpiginous. Good. Hey, see, so you could have done some slithering type thing over there. All right. Uh, this is another one of the older patients, right? And you get the pseudopodial-like extension from the disc. Usually, you know, it's usually contiguous with the disc. Uh, CMV occurs at a leading edge in, uh, oh, I don't want to give it away. I think I'm about to ask that. Okay. So there's a pseudopodial extension. This one's very different from all the other ones, in my opinion. Symptoms, blurred vision, scotomata, vitritis, minimal, CMV, Yes or no? Yes. yes. A lot or a little? The hedger. 25 to 50%. 25%. Excellent. That's what the book says. And so I put it, of the CNV formers, it's on the lower end of the spectrum. So this is an FA. And your FA findings are your blocks early stains late. But if you've got CNV, then it's obviously going to show your typical cult or classic CNV presentations. So ICGA findings, you just get these hypofluorescent lesions throughout uh, all the phases. And autofluorescence findings, this is, uh, I don't think anybody ever asked this question, but I think autofluorescence helps the most of all the white dots with serpiginous because the active lesions are going to be hyper autofluorescence right at, autofluorescent right at the border, and the inactive ones are going to be hyper. We used to do repeat FAs every time somebody came in with this. I say this as though I have like 50 of these patients, but when I was a fellow and I had one, every time she came in saying, I think I have symptoms, we have to do an FA. <laughs> And now uh, it's we do autofluorescence a lot more. It's not it's less invasive. I guess nothing's non-invasive, right? Um, and then these are one of the ones in which we do use IMT because again you could think of IMT 
as being used to anybody who has a poor visual prognosis because we're trying to do something. If something resolves on its own, then we're not going to do anything about it. And so immunomodulatory therapy, yes. And here's a picture. Here's two months later. See how that granulates? And granulate is probably not the right word, but you get this granular retinal, retinal pigment epithelial sort of changes um, that occur. Now, this is another patient I had when I was a fellow. Again, I think all the interesting cases happened like when I was a fellow, but I just took a lot more pictures than I think. Anyway, but again, I haven't seen this kind of case since then. This is not actually serpiginous, but it looks very close to it. The reason it's not is, one, you don't see anything contiguous with the disc, right? You've got sparing of the peripapillary area, juxtapapillary area, if you will. This has uh, vitreous cells, which serpiginous doesn't as often it can. And this patient also comes from a TB endemic country and has a positive PPD. So we call this tuberculous serpiginous-like choroidopathy or choroiditis. Um, so it's important to differentiate because the treatment is different. White dot syndrome, yes or no? Tamana says no. Chris says uh, for OHS. Gotcha. Ocular histoplasmosis syndrome, which is differentiated from this based on what? This is MCP. How, what's the classic way? Botrytis. Right. So which one has botrytis? MCP. Right. So uh, this is multifocal choroiditis, panuveitis, MCP. Okay. That's the other thing I drew last night. It's getting late. Young, it's the YMF. It's like the Outer bank stickers you see on people's cars. <laughs> young myopic female. Tamana, are you a young myopic female? No, don't say. We don't want to disclose PII. Um, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. true. Oh, you're cured. <laughs> you're a YFMF, former myopic female. All right. Yeah. Just our YFFM. You don't want to say former any female. Anyway, Bruce uh, Center. Okay. So young myopic female, part one of three, because there are two others that are going to be this. And uh, the symptoms are very much like every, in the young myopic female category, most of them have photopsias and large blind spot and blurred vision. Although photopsia is common to all three, I think that in large blind spots only a two out of three. Anyway, vitritis, yes or no? We already said yes. Okay, but variable. And there's our triad CME, ERM, and cataracts. And then C and V, yes or no? Everybody says. You, yes, right. And only in 28% of presentation. So we're going to say more than serpiginous, less than uh, one of the other sisters. And MCP, another picture, patient I managed, although don't remember very well anymore. FA findings, blocks early, stains late for active lesions. The inactive lesions, just it's a transmission defect. So you just get that hyperfluorescence throughout. ICG, for MCP, ICG has more lesions and... This was helpful in differentiating my ampi patient from MCP because the ampi patient had uh, kind of different sized uh, lesions compared with the typical. And so the ICG actually helped us to say, okay, this is not MCP. This is more like ampi. All right. Autofluorescence findings. Active lesions are hyperautofluorescence. Inactive are hypo. And all the ones I'm showing you on this picture are hypo. So this is all inactive. Uh, is IMT helpful? Yes because they have a poor visual prognosis. They also have issues with CMV, although IMT does not always help CMV. Back in the old days, these people got steroids, and some of their CMVs did get better, although nowadays most of them are getting anti-VEGF, of course. Okay, this is a patient with MCP. You can see some hemorrhage there, CMV going on. Two years later, scarring up. Um, I think the patient got anti-VEGF when they first came in, but that was kind of borderline anti-VEGF day. So anyway, and there's the OCT, because how can I not show you an OCT? Look at those punched out lesions. You see the hyperreflectivity in the choroid because the RPE, somebody took a hole puncher to it, right? And you could just see right through it. Good. So another VKH patient with little white dots. I actually have another VKH patient at Haven for Hope that's got much more prominent white dots. I don't think I've taken a picture or I haven't transferred it. Okay. White dot syndrome, yes or no, uh, Aaron? Yes. That's right. And do you know which one? It's pick. That's right. Punctate inner choroidopathy and younger or older than MCP patients on average? Anybody? All right. Older? Well, younger. Pick is younger. Think of pick as the younger sister of MCP. 29 years old versus 45. I don't know why we said young myopic female on the MCP because, well, I mean, 45 year olds can be young too. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. With no residents are 45 in this room. Okay, symptoms. Photopsia, metamorphopsia this time in blurred vision, didn't have the enlarged blind spot, 
And then Vitritis, yes or no? Never. <laughs> Until they cross over and become MCP or something. Okay, CMV, yes or no? Yes, good. This is the main CMV one, this 79% of presentation. So if somebody said to you, which of the following white dot syndromes is most likely to be associated with CMV at presentation, you'd always pick pick, right? Pick pick. Uh, CMV and pick together, as always. FA findings. All right, this is not an early block stain later. This is an early hyper late stainer. So this is an exception to that rule, and so is another one. ICG findings, hypofluorescent spots equal the same number that you have on FA. That is not intuitive because the C in the name is throwing me off, but whatever. All right, autofluorescence, eh, meh. And IMT helpful, yes or no? Not usually because we're treating these guys with anti-VEGF, and CMV is the main reason why they lose vision. All right, which white dot syndrome is this, Tamana? Now, I've already asked you, Chris. It almost looks like ampy. It does, and I thought it was ampy, but it turned out to be sarcoidosis. This is a patient I have when I was a first year, like July, or yeah, July of my first year of residency. <laughs> anyway. It you, was like that, you just... Just like that, we thought it was Ampy, and I was so excited about it, and the corny attending that was working with me was so excited about Ampy, and then uh, it didn't go away, and then we did this big workup, and it's all negative, I should present it. And then, uh, like, three or four months later, Gary and Lane says, it's time to repeat a workup. And so we said, yes, sir, repeated it, and chest x-ray had hyaluronopathy, and, uh, and her skin biopsy, which had been read before, was, and this weird stuff, they all of a sudden thought it was sarcoid as well. So she actually had a not a great uh, uh, outcome because you know this sarcoid uh, optic neuropathy kind of thing you can kind of see some involvement of the optic nerve visually speaking didn't do well long term got out of the military anyway uh, okay so this is a white dot syndrome yes or no Tamana kind of looks like a resolving VKH yeah. but it is one right it's multiple evanescent and white dot syndrome Mutes. this is a friend of mine who actually said I'm having some vision changes when I was a fellow of course I said you should come in and so sure enough she had this and uh, there is a pathognomonic sign to this disease. You may know what it is. The wreath, kind of. What is the wreath? FA granularity. Why do we call it a wreath? It's a circle. A circle, and what else about the circle? Where is the circle? It's right. It's going around the phobia. We used to say it was like a bunch of little circles like that, but it's really a big circle around the phobia. I, for whatever reason, there was some confusion when I was in training, but that's what it is. There's something else that's even more pathognomonic. Granular uh, macular changes, right? Okay, well, maybe not, but that is that is it. So, And this is our third young myopic female YMF, and symptoms... Photopsy, a large blind spot, and blurred vision. This is the big sibling to AIBES because if you have all these symptoms but have no white dots, we might call you acute idiopathic blind spot enlargement syndrome, which is a mouthful. Uh, vitritis, yes or no? Eh, maybe. And CNV, yes or no? Not usually, although it can happen. And here's our granular pigmentary changes. Not the best picture for that, but you can kind of say, well, maybe that's some granular, granular things there. Uh, here's that wreath. Again, you know, you look at this, I wouldn't go, oh, that looks like a Christmas wreath, but that's kind of what we're talking about here. So FA findings, punctate, hyperfluorescent spots that surround the phobia in a wreath-like configuration. ICG findings, anybody know? More numerous than FA or the same? More. And I never got an ICG on my friend, and I always wished I had. <laughs> ERG findings, this is the only other ERG question on here besides Azor, which I don't really care about as much. You get a diminished A wave and early receptor potentials, so they're both diminished, and it's reversible because this is usually is a very benign course. Autofluorescence findings, meh, and uh, IMT helpful, not usually because, again, it's benign self-limited. You kind of see how you can answer these, these questions now because you have the tools to think about who are we using IMT on. Who's getting CME and cataract and ERL? It's the guys that are getting botrytis, right? Um, so that's, this is somebody else's ICG. I think this is Dr. Benson's. I should have given him credit. Back to my patient, my friend, who I think one of my attendings uh, called her some inappropriate something or other. She told me it was very uncomfortable. I said, sorry, I 
he's old <laughs> and, and old guys do weird stuff. <laughs> he pats me on the butt. So at least he didn't pat you on the butt. <laughs> All of my co fellows know exactly who I'm talking about, too. That's the funny part. He also liked to call, call you Tiger. Anyway, so what I want you to see in this, it, exactly, it is uh, that next to the nerve, you lose your ellipsoid zone. We weren't calling it that at the time. We were calling it ISO when so I took this picture. But you lose the ellipsoid zone, it kind of drops out. And you also have that kind of lumpy, bumpy appearance of it in the fovea. And that kind of fits with where your symptoms are. You get some blurred vision and you have a large blind spot. Well, look, the photoreceptors explain that. So I think I have one other. Uh, Poor quality uh, OCT coming up. Yeah, this is from uh, a different platform, not Spectralis. You can see right there where the green dots are uh, levitating and, and rotating. That That's that little area corresponding to a white dot. You'll have to take my word for it since I didn't put the color photo up there. Um, this is not a white dot syndrome. If anybody guesses what this is, I'll buy them a coffee. Anybody? All right. It's got Dalen Fuchs nodules or used to. This is sympathetic ophthalmia. I'm, which I've like seen maybe once my whole life. I keep on trying to create it by offering more surgery to my patients. But that whole thing that Dan Johnson says about, you know, if you get more than three vitrectomies, you're getting sympathetic. I eh, haven't seen it yet. And Dave Kim's done a lot of vitrectomies <laughs> on some of the same patients, and I don't think he's ever seen it. In fact, I asked him last week. So we're going to create some more, but it's exquisitely sensitive to steroids, so it's really not that big of a deal. Okay, uh, and plus there's Ozerdex now. Krill disease, acute retinal pigment epitheliitis, never, ever seen it. Uh, I um, corresponded with somebody on YouTube that said he'd had it, um, and that's the only interaction I've had with anybody that's ever had it. In fact, if you look for pictures of it, really hard to find. These are from the book. These are probably like some of the only photos in the whole world. Um, no treatment usually resolves within 6 to 12 weeks. Metamorphopsia scotomata. You can tell I'm not going to test you on it. This is, uh, could be anything... We thought maybe progressive outer retinal necrosis turned out to be acute retinal necrosis. I think this person had VZV on PCR. Okay, we talked about HIV retinopathy. HIV retinopathy could look like this. This particular patient had a really severe form of lupus. Very poor prognosis. I can show you the picture sometime. Uh, Co-fellow Paul Baker presented that. So this is another one of those. You'll never see it outside of the BCSC, but this is subretinal fibrosis and uveitis syndrome. I do have one patient I think might have this, but very uh, uncommon, not even worth reading my notes on it. Okay, now we get to the great, uh, I wouldn't even say masquerader, the, the really squirrely one to diagnose. This is Azor. These pictures are, make it very obvious. If I ever had a patient with this, I'd hope I wouldn't miss it. I've got two patients in my bank of patients that I am debating between autoimmune retinopathy and Azor. And the reason why they're still on the AIR side is because they have antibodies against their, their uh, retinal antigens. But they could have Azor because they have very similar findings. What's the defi definition? Acute loss of one or more zones of ocular retinal function associated with photopsia. Uh, minimal fundoscopic changes in abnormal ERG findings. Let's see what I've got here. Difficult to diagnose. It's called occult for a reason. And symptoms. I just mentioned those. Photopsia, variable scotomata. It's fun to say scotomata. It's like that, you know, we don't pluralize everything by just adding an S to it. Although if you said scotomas, you'd probably be more understood than scotomata. Vitritis is mild, and CNV is not common. ERG findings, delayed 30 hertz flicker, reminds you of birdshot, but it obviously doesn't look like birdshot. This is, the book actually has a picture of AAOR, acute annular outer retinopathy. It doesn't have the word occult in it, right? and calls it Azor, which is really confusing to me because the whole point of Azor is that when it's acute, there's no fundoscopic findings. We can say minimal, but that picture they show of autofluorescence, it's like this big, gigantic white mass that's like leaping off the page at you, and they call it Azor, but originally it's described as AAOR when you look at the uh, uh, published, the publication where it was originally published in. So that's why I think this is really confusing. This is that picture of AAOR, which now they want to call Azor, so again, not worth testing over kind of run into the end of my lecture, so we'll just kind of review here. So we talked about the Azor complex diseases, Azor MCP mutes, their little siblings, PIC and is being the main one that you need to know, AAOR and AIBES, not as important, although AIBES is way more common than some of these other ones. And then I talked about Ampi and Serpiginous, and they had this other one called Relentless Placoid Choreoretinitis, or they originally wanted to call it Ampiginous Choreoretinitis, as the story goes, but the journal rejected that name. So they went with RPC, but that's kind of that merger, that halfway hybrid between serpiginous and ampi. So just remember MCP and PIC are related, MUDES and AIBS are related. 
and you got this continuum with serpiginous, ampiginous, and acute plaque or ampi. And then birdshot's very different from all the rest. So that's kind of the way I think of it. Oh, we got a little quiz. Sorry, getting ahead of myself here. Okay, MCP and pick. As the only young myopic or formerly myopic female in the room, uh, which one's older, MCP or pick? MCP. Right. Okay, which one has smaller spots? Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to click on that. You're right. Vitritis, which one has vitritis? MCP. Good, pick does not. CMV at presentation? Pick. They could both have it, but more likely to be pick. And then which has a worse visual prognosis? MCP. That's right. Good. I must be teaching this well because the first time I gave that quiz, everybody got wrong. Oh, second quiz. Ampi versus serpiginous. Which one is a viral prodrome? Yeah. Right. 50%. Serpiginous, no. Papillitis. Nope. Oh, I just thought because it was close. Yeah, you know, I actually didn't have this in the lecture. So, um, but yeah, you're right. It is close to the nerve. That would make sense. But Ampi can have some optic disc edema. That was in the original uh, lecture. Vitritis, which one? Yeah, both can have some. Ampi might be a little more likely. Again, you're not really going to mix these two up usually. C and V. Mm -mm. Ampi, I say no to oh, serpiginous. I, I said anything can have anything. But, okay. <laughs> but classically, Ampi does not have C and V. Worst visual prognosis. Therefore, we use IMT in serpiginous and not Ampi. Good. All right, now this is the uh -oh. this is double jeopardy, right? All right. Blocks early stains late. I've primed you for all these before I just kind of left them on slides and then left everybody foundering. So, okay, uh, birdshot, yes or no? Well, I said it wasn't very helpful, but... <laughs> okay, so you caught me on that one. Technically, I think it's a yes, but so yes on Ampi. What about serpiginous? Yes. It, it, so, uh, uh, it, serpiginous, yeah, it, it is a blocks early stains late. What else did I say about it? If you have... Uh, C and V, that's going to be different. So if they have C and V, it's different. There's two that classically are not uh, blocks early stains late. Uh, so MCP is a blocks early stains late. So that leaves us with mutes and pick that do not block early stain late. Okay. That's more important. The ICG ones, oh, so hard for me to remember. I had to go back to my lecture when I had that patient that had ampi versus MCP and go, uh. So uh, I'll just run through it. If you know it, great. Uh, ICG is not more numerous than FA on ampi. Uh, and pick, and that's it. Finally, IMT, we've talked about throughout. Birdshot, yes or no? Yes. Good. Ampi, yes or no? Good. Serpiginous, yes or no? Yes. Good. MCP, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Pick? No. Mixed results, no is the answer. And mutes? No. Good. Now, you guys know more about UVitis than I do, if you can remember what I just told you. <laughs> uh, okay, sources... My own poor brain plus all these guys and uh, and source and literature and then uh, hopefully I'll be able to upload this assuming it records correctly and uh, anyway any questions? Dan says no. He's getting ready to go to the OR. Big <laughs> thumbs up. Okay, thanks guys.